Hi boys and girls, spring is here. The season has arrived for longer, warmer days, maybe a little bit more rain, but certainly no more snow. And we're starting to head towards warmer and warmer and warmer weather until we get to summer. I'm starting to see all these new buds. Tons of flowers are growing around my garden. And one of the special parts about being up here in Big Bear is that there are little animals everywhere. The chipmunks are so busy in the garden. There are bunnies, there are lizards everywhere, baby ones, adult ones, everybody's running around, everybody's busy foraging for food, getting what they need, right? Now that all this food is here, because they are eating the plants. So we're gonna be looking a little bit at the different elements of the food chain, from producers to consumers, and I'll talk more about that later. I'm also gonna look a little bit at animal classification with you. What's the difference between an animal being called a mammal versus a reptile versus a bird? What are the qualities that scientists look at to decide what category does do each of the animals fall under? And then I have a special little treat. Earlier on during this Safer at Home ordinance, there were two tiny, tiny infant chipmunks on the side of the street while I went out for a walk one day. And this was when it was still snowing a lot. And we tried to find its mother. We looked all around to see if there was a little den where they had rolled down the hill from. And we even safely moved them so that the mother could come and find them. But by the evening, when the night was coming and a snowstorm was coming, we decided we really had to take them in and protect them, in part because of predators, which goes with the food chain. We'll talk about that. There are predators here that would eat those baby chipmunks. But also they could have just frozen to death on the side of the road in a, you know, buried under the snow throughout the night. Now, the reason why I'm explaining all of that is because ideally one shouldn't actually take wild animals into your own home. You should send them to a refuge center or a rescue center where there are professionals there whose whole job is to help save the animal, but in a way that allows the animal to go back into the wild. One, because it's the right thing to do. A wild chipmunk should return to the wild because that is where it should live freely and not just like in a cage as a pet, right? But two, it's actually against the law. It's illegal to take an animal from the wild, bring them into your home and make them be your pet. So we were very happy to say that we successfully were able to send the chipmunks back out into the wild. And I'll tell you about how we did that later and they're now off living with the other chipmunks in my little chipmunk community here. Um, all right, so let's get started. When scientists are classifying animals, they'll start with whether the animal is a vertebrate or an invertebrate. If it's an invertebrate, it means it does not have a backbone like butterflies or grasshoppers or spiders. If it does have a backbone, then it's a vertebrate. And vertebrates are mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and fish. One of the first classifications of animals that I'd like you to know are mammals because we're actually in the mammal category. Mammals are all the animals that feed their young with milk, they have fur or hair, and they breathe with their lungs. Mammals include everything from little rabbits and chipmunks to your pet dogs and cats, to large animals like lions and elephants and bears, and even in the ocean, marine animals like whales and dolphins are actually mammals. The next classification that is in abundance all around us are birds, of course. Birds are the only animals that have feathers. They lay eggs rather than giving birth to a live baby like mammals do. They breathe air, they have wings, and they have a beak. Some examples you've seen here in Big Bear are the Stellar's Jays, and then of course this Robin that's trying to protect her nest, and then scary, we have giant red-tailed hawks and even bald eagles up here. 
Some animals like the amphibian frogs or the insect of the butterfly go through what we call a metamorphosis, which is a big physical change. For example, this caterpillar started as an egg, became a larva. He's going to spin his chrysalis and turn into a butterfly. Do you remember when we had our caterpillar life cycle lesson in the classroom? And we took them all the way through to butterflies and released them in our edible garden. Reptiles are also in abundance in Big Bear. These are animals that lay eggs. They have scaly skin. We describe them as scales. They breathe air using lungs and they include things like these lizards, rattlesnakes, alligators, and turtles. Because they are what we call cold-blooded, they don't heat up for themselves like we do as mammals. We are warm-blooded. So I'm always seeing the lizards basking out on the rocks and these warm concrete blocks. So this is a great example of the urban environment affecting the natural environment. Because these concrete blocks that are creating a little wall have actually become chipmunk apartments. And we watch the chipmunks scurrying in and out of these tiny little holes and caves that they have turned into their dens. The chipmunks that we rescued are, of course, mammals. That means that they rely on their mothers at the beginning of their lives for milk. We had to research what kind of milk to get them so we wouldn't hurt them, and we found out that we could give them a special formula of puppy milk. I had to feed them with a little syringe like a tiny bottle. And something unique about them is that you have to sort of tickle their tummies to get them to go pee pee or poo poo at the beginning. They really like the tickle. And look at his little eyes are open now. Aww. You have eyes now. Because chipmunks are very energetic and we wanted them to be able to practice running around and climbing so that they could go back out into the wild, Paul built them a very large cage. Climb. Climb. Good climbing. You won't be able to your curly and jump and grab right there. Even the cage started to feel way too small really quickly. These chipmunks were so active that we let them climb around like a jungle gym in our dining room tree and also around on the logs to practice foraging for food. We would hide little nuts and watch them find it and then hide them themselves. Things got tricky for us because at this age, they're so cute and so playful that we fell in love with them, but we knew we had to release them. That's a finger, Silly. That's a finger. That's not a food. That's not a food. Ooh, doo, doo, doo. Doo, 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 so we did a thing called a soft release that we learned from an animal refuge center where you let them go in the morning and keep their cage out for them to return to at night until they find their way into the chipmunk community. And that's what we did. And after about three nights of them returning, they stopped returning. But every morning they went off running out into the wild having a lovely time so we feel very confident that they've become a part of our chipmunk community. Now that we know about the big bear animals, let's talk about the food chain. It all starts with sunlight providing energy for the plants to grow and because the plants use photosynthesis to create their own food because they are producing their own food, we call them the producers, and they're the foundation of the food chain. The primary consumers are the ones that eat the producers, and they're herbivores, which is kind of like what we call vegetarians because they live on plant life, like grass and nuts. The secondary consumers can eat plants as well, but they eat the primary consumers. So they eat those little chipmunks and those little caterpillars and those little bunnies. 
Next, the tertiary consumers eat the secondary consumers. Well, and actually they can even eat the primary consumers. Some of them are omnivores who eat both plants and animals like, you know, bears even eat berries. And some of them are carnivores who eat only animals. These are all animals that tend to be at the top of their food chain. This is how to read a simple food chain. The sun provides energy for the apple tree. The apple tree provides energy for the rabbit. The rabbit provides energy for the bobcat. Try it with me. The sun provides energy for the leaves. The leaves provide energy for the caterpillar. The caterpillar provides energy for the lizard. The lizard provides energy for the hawk. There are a couple of activities to do with this lesson, not really experiments, because once we're into the animal world, we can't really do experiments. However, you could write some sort of book or poster display or art project to describe animal classification. Another thing you're going to do is draw out some animal food chains. Choose an animal that you're curious about, research what their food chain is, and then draw that out and present it. We'll look forward to seeing some of these on Flipgrid. And I hope you enjoyed getting to see those adorable chipmunks. I miss them so much. And imagine them off in the wild, happily foraging and with their new little chipmunk community. I miss you guys too so much. See you next time. <laughs>